It's just gone lunchtime. This is all angles here on ENCA. Good afternoon. I'm Masil Khorashlaha. It is that time of the day when we give you an update on how far some of the stories we've been following up for you on channel today have advanced. Here's your lunchtime update. Our reporters are out and about bringing you the latest on today's top stories. Let's get an update now. I'm joined by a VUM dealer in Johannesburg. Sipamandla Koke is in Pretoria and Aisha Ishmael is in Cape Town. All right, Aviwe, let's start with you. You attended today's media briefing by the city of Joburg, updating residents about last week's gas explosion in the city centre. What exactly did the city manager say? Well, Maseko, we're still none the wiser into what exactly led to that gas explosion or the source of the actual gas itself. What was ruled out is that it's not ethane gas, uh, but they're still telling us that laboratory tests are currently being done and they're expecting those results any day now, and as well as investigations that are currently being done. But on the ground, we've been told that a lot of work is actually being done and electricity around Bree Street, this particular area, uh, has been restored and they're now currently working on restoring water with some of it being promised to be restored uh, by the end of today but today actually marks seven days exactly since that gas actually tore through Bree Street and of course leaving a lot of cars and also people uh, you know uh, injured in the wake of it but what we do know from that briefing that we had now from the city manager Floyd Brink uh, he suggests that they are now in the process of declaring this a local state of disaster now that legislative work is actually currently underway and we promise that within seven days they'll give us feedback on where that process is that is of course uh, will be the, the the process that will release funds for Bree Street uh, to actually be repaired and go back to some sort of normalcy in fact let's take a listen to the city manager Floyd Brink on that earlier on briefing just on the local state of disaster as a city we have now commenced the process of compiling a report to the provincial Management Center, the, the PDMC, through the Disaster Management Center, in order for us to commence with the necessary legislative processes to declare the explosion a local state of disaster. The declaration of the disaster is critical in order for us to allow us also to assess the impact of the explosion on our infrastructure and the cost for the rehabilitation and or the reconstruction work that, that must take place in that area. To classify the disaster accordingly in line with the Act and to declare the disaster accordingly once the outline processes have been concluded. So it's quite critical for us from an IGR process and regulations and legislation for us to comply first with those processes. We have now mandated the Disaster Management Center to commence with the processes and to finalize a report to the submission of the PDMC within the next seven days. Mm. All right, Sipa, your focus today is about the water situation in Hamanskral in Pretoria. Dozens of deaths from a cholera outbreak in that area, yet we still don't know where exactly that cholera came from. Uh, what is the, re the Water Research Commission telling us? We are not about to know anytime soon where is the original source of what happened in Hamanskral. Mm. What is the source that led to the outbreak? Unfortunately, the findings of the study that were released today by the Water Research Commission were unable to clearly identify the original source. And according to the findings of the study, or rather of the study, water at this moment is not classified as the original source of that cholera outbreak in Hamanskral. However, a disturbing finding is that Water in Hamanskral has the highest level of E. coli, and that is very worrying and disturbing. And those are the findings of the study. And the study also finds that indeed the quality of water in, in Hamanskral is not good and of high quality, it's not conducive for people to drink it or to use it for any other thing like cooking, which poses another high risk in terms of food security. The research and the study did find that indeed the environment made it possible for the outbreak to thrive in that part of the capital city because they found that water is dating, high levels of E. coli and also 
water itself is not of high quality therefore all those factors contributed to what led to the outbreak or the spread of the outbreak in Hamanskra. let's take a listen to the ceo of the water research commission unpacking the findings of the study and what needs to happen moving forward Yes, there is no source, and from the significance of the study that was done both in the water resource and in the drinking water, we're not able to detect if water particularly was the source of the cholera in Hamas. The risk persists, uh, the risk not only for cholera but for any other waterborne disease because we have these high levels of E. coli which need to be broken down to see what is the cause. And also what we are articulating to the people and saying they must not drink, it is just for household. I think that's another risk. I mean, how do you, as, a, as an adult, you may be able to control that. How do you manage to control a child who will open a tap just at home and then maybe not have that understanding? Mm, and Aisha, South Africa is expected to have a new public protector soon. And today, the ad hoc committee to nominate a person for this appointment uh, met today to uh, discuss a short list of candidates. Do we know who made the cut? So out of a list of 38, um, two people withdrew and we're now sitting with a short list of eight people. And I did speak to the chairperson, Cyril Klaba, about the process and he says that he's very happy with the way that the process had unfolded. And as you say, we're now a step closer to getting a new public protector. But of course, the eight people will now have to be interviewed. They will then have to be a recommendation made to Parliament and at the end of the day it is the President of the Republic of South Africa who will have to make that final decision. This is what the chairperson of the ad hoc committee had to say. Well I'm excited that we have reached this point. I, I can now report that um, the committee has unanimously agreed on eight uh, candidates that um, we must uh, invite for interviews. Uh, we've decided that the interviews will be over two days uh, on the 23rd and 24th uh, of, of August. I'm excited uh, that the public uh, made this uh, uh, process um, uh, possible. Uh, they gave us uh, good uh, comments. Um, even when the committee uh, decided on the other principles, uh, as guiding principles, uh, to, which determine, which basically start to look at what type of a candidate um, are, are we looking at. We looked at character, we looked at experience, we looked at skills, we looked at uh, knowledge. And, and then uh, after having done that, also looking at the questionnaire, because even the questionnaire, they provided information that would not get in the CVs. All right, that was your ENCA lunchtime update from all angles with reporters Aisha Ishmael, Sipamadla Koke and Avu Mdila. Thank you very much, team. Let's leave it there for now.